Tonight on NJ Spotlight News, sleeping in. High schoolers in Bergen County's largest school district get an extra 30 minutes before the first bell. I think the students are going to be more alert and they're going to be, um, you know, more productive in their class. Plus, COVID-19 case uptick. As cases rise across the country, some universities here in New Jersey are still mandating vaccines. They're require, requiring kids who are living on campus to be vaccinated against COVID. Also, a month in, still no deal. The RWJ nurses strike heads into week five. Is the hospital playing hardball? They're willing to spend millions of dollars on replacement workers rather than agreeing to clear staffing standards that, that would benefit patients as well as nurses. And it's payback time. Millions of borrowers prepare for federal student loan payments to resume next month. Check your statement because interest starts now. If you haven't reached out to your loan servicer, do so now. If you haven't mm -hmm. been on the studentaid.gov, do so now. NJ Spotlight News begins right now. Funding for NJ Spotlight News provided by the members of the New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child. RWJ Barnabas Health, let's be healthy together. And Orsted, committed to the creation of a new long-term, sustainable, clean energy future for New Jersey. From NJPBS, this is NJ Spotlight News with Brianna Venosi. Good evening and thanks for joining us this Tuesday night. I'm Brianna Venosi. There are probably fewer people who dreaded the sound of their alarm clock this morning than teenagers heading back for the first day of school. And Bergen County's largest school district is among several throughout the state that have taken the plunge to adopt a later start time. The majority of residents have long supported pushing back high school daily schedules over concerns that teens just aren't getting enough sleep with piles of medical research to back it. But there's also pushback from parents and educators educators who are concerned about how a later start to the day will impact sports and other activities. Raven Santana checked in at Ridgewood High on this first later day of school. I think the students are going to be more alert and they're going to be, um, you know, more productive in their class. That's because nearly 1,800 students that attend Ridgewood High School located in Bergen County's largest school district will get some extra time to sleep after the district changed its time from 7.45 a.m. to 8.20 a.m. I've been working on this for 10 years now, so um, a lot of these problems and, and things that have been worked out and worked through but we have to remember the reason we're doing this is for the kids. Lawmakers in 2022 introduced legislation mandating all school districts to make similar changes by 2024, 2025, pushing high school start times to no earlier than 8.30 a.m., but it never passed. Ridgewood High School's principal, Jeff Nias, says giving students more sleep in the morning to be more productive isn't just an opinion. It's based on research and science. Dr. Bert Mandelbaum breaks it all down. Specifically for adolescents, that as they go, kids get older, there is a shift in their normal sleep times. So they call it the circadian rhythms. And so adolescents have a two to three hour phase shift from when they were younger, where it is really hard for them to fall asleep much earlier than 10, 30 or 11. And it is really hard for them to wake up much earlier than 7 a.m. Combined with that, we know that they need at least eight hours of sleep, if not closer to nine hours of sleep, to function. And administrators I spoke with here at the school say they are confident that the extra time in the morning will support students' mental health and academic achievements. We'll make adjustments. I mean, just a few years ago, we, we, we turned everything upside down for COVID and we made that work. This is relatively minor adjustment relative to that, but very significant in, in so far as helping kids to, to be healthy and to do better in school. Ridgewood is one of a handful of districts that have made similar changes, including Princeton, South Orange, Maplewood, and Chatham. Chatham Superintendent Michael Lasusa shared the overall impacts in his district since implementing a later start time last year. The students are reporting 
sleeping more uh, to start with. And then beyond that, they also report uh, being more alert during the school day, uh, being in a better mood, being more likely to eat breakfast before the day begins. And then beyond that, we've seen that there's been a reduction in the number of students who are chronically late to school and a reduction in the number of students who are failing courses. We also have seen a reduction in the uh, percentage of our students reporting suicide ideation or uh, very concerning depressive uh, periods. We haven't seen uh, an impact, a negative or adverse impact on uh, athletics or extracurricular activities. Even with pediatricians recommending later start times for high schoolers, Naya says there still has been some pushback from those concerned that the time change will negatively impact after school activities like sports. He disagrees. Our sports are going to be just fine. Um, practices will be pushed back uh, at most 10 minutes. Naya says they will conduct surveys at the end of the year to evaluate and reassess how the time shift went and what else they can improve. Ridgewood superintendent now hopes the change will be made in more districts or even statewide. For NJ Spotlight News, I'm Raven Santana. Well, the school year is off and running, but summer is holding on with a white knuckled grip, hitting the state with sweltering temperatures and a heat wave that's forecast to last through Thursday. The National Weather Service says the heat index will peak above 100 degrees all week, making for dangerously hot conditions. A heat advisory has been issued for all or parts of 15 counties, and it's forcing some New Jersey schools to dismiss students early. From Winslow Township in Camden County to as far north as Metuchen and Belleville, school districts are opting for half days or early dismissal with no after-school activities. In North Jersey, other schools may avoid the worst of it due to late week openings. For anyone who's been asking where the summer weather was during July and August, well, it's finally arrived. Well, after a quiet summer, cases and hospitalizations from COVID-19 are on the rise. First Lady Jill Biden on Monday tested positive for the virus, but she's experiencing mild symptoms and, according to a White House spokesperson, is recovering at the family home in Delaware. Meanwhile, President Biden has tested negative and White House officials say he'll be monitored and tested regularly. It's all a reminder that COVID infections are still among us. New Jersey is also seeing an uptick. Hospitalizations increased more than 50 percent since July, according to data from the State Department of Health. 326 people are hospitalized with the virus as of today, though public health experts say there's no reason to panic. Total case counts remain low both here and nationwide. The U.S. is not expected to have a dangerous wave of illness like we saw during the height of the pandemic, which is one reason Rutgers University is getting a lot of criticism for keeping a mandate requiring all students to be vaccinated against COVID-19. As our health care writer Lilo Stainton found out, the vaccine rule is among the strictest in the country, but not rare. She joins me now. Lilo, good to see you. Uh, let me just start off the bat with what exactly is Rutgers University requiring? Uh, because I think there's still confusion about what constitutes being fully vaccinated. Right. Well, my understanding is that they just require a primary series for students on campus. And there's some groups that would require a booster as well. Um, you know, and those are sort of the clinical programs, um, people in nursing and, you know, physician programs and things like that. But Rutgers is not alone, right? Montclair University is requiring kids who are living on campus to be vaccinated against COVID. And as I wrote about today, you know, this is one of many vaccines or several, I should say, that, that kids get for colleges, at least in New Jersey. Well, that's interesting because obviously Rutgers being, you know, the state's flagship uh, university, the largest, Montclair, not far behind it. Is that one of the factors that went into this decision making, just the sheer amount of the student body and people who are on those campuses? Well, um, my, you know, it makes sense sort of from an epidemiological point of view. I mean, Rutgers said in its policy that, you know, the goal is 
to, you know, it's congregate housing, right? And I also talked to Dr. Stephanie Silvera Montclair, and, you know, she said it, their, their requirement only applies to actually a fairly small group. I think it's less than a third of, because residential students are a, less than a third of their total student population on campus, you know, that's the most at-risk group, right? You really are living close together. You're sharing, you know, water fountains or, you know, bathrooms, all kinds of things. And we know COVID doesn't necessarily spread that way, but it's the close contact, right? You were breathing on each other in a closer proximity. So there's clearly some science to it, regardless of the fact that, you know, obviously, People who uh, oppose mandates are frustrated because they don't see it as making any sense at this point during sure. the pandemic. Sure, with the pandemic largely behind us. Uh, but I mean, you mentioned re vaccine requirements are not new to the state. What exactly right. does the state law say and how does that apply to other folks who have students that aren't yet in the college world? Right, right. So look, it, this is if you're a, if you're a child growing up in New Jersey, you're going to get a lot of shots. I mean, not there. You're vaccinated against nearly a dozen things um, at some point in your childhood. For colleges, the state law requires three vaccines. It, they actually protect against five different diseases, but it's measles, mumps, rubella. That's one shot. Hepatitis B is another shot, and then. Uh, a shot to protect a meningococcal vaccine, which protects against a bunch of things that cause meningitis and other diseases. So, you know, three shots and it's sort of, it, you know, when you get them depends on sort of how old you are and what you've had before, but um, those are required. And it turns out, you know, even, even the schools, the two schools that we found that are requiring COVID shots aren't alone. I mean, they're, you know, more than a hundred nationwide that are requiring this. Healthcare writer Lilo Stainton for us. Lilo, thanks so much. Thank you, Bree. To read more of Lilo's reporting on school vaccine requirements, head to njspotlightnews.org. Support for the medical report is provided by Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. Pandemic-era government funding is set to expire this month for the child care industry, presenting a new crisis for hundreds of thousands of families across the country. Experts are warning some 70,000 child care programs, including many in New Jersey, could close their doors, leaving parents with even fewer and less affordable options. Senior correspondent Joanna Gagas reports. We have seen in this Congress proposals to massive cuts to Head Start after the last Congress where we funded them. I have to say that that would be a huge mistake. Mikey Sherrill says New Jersey and the nation are about to fall off a child care cliff if proposed cuts to early education programs like this Head Start program in Dover are enacted in Congress. On top of this, the pandemic relief funding that we put in place is facing what many of you may have heard of as the child care cliff. It runs out at the end of September. American Rescue Plan dollars from the pandemic helped the families of 3 million children afford childcare, but as of September 30th, those funds will run out, meaning more than a thousand childcare provider facilities here in New Jersey alone could close their doors. The American Rescue Plan, which was the federal COVID dollars that supported childcare, was they were really a lifeline for programs for working families because it didn't just look at what's traditionally funded by the federal government, which is low-income uh, working families, it looked at the totality of the system. The problem is without those dollars, we're looking at a system that was fragile before COVID becoming even more of a problem. It could impact 305 families whose kids attend Head Start Community Program of Morris County here in Dover, forcing their parents to stop working when they lose childcare. If those funds are threatened, those families will not be able to receive services from Head Start. Um, they, we also provide the whole day childcare that they would not be able to receive the youngest children who are from birth all the way up to age three would have no services whatsoever. And research tells us that for brain development, that period is the most important from zero to three and then subsequently from uh, four to five. Cheryl's joined with other members of Congress, including Senator Cory Booker, 
urging President Biden to work with Congress to provide $16 billion a year to avoid a child care crisis. Without federal action, we'll see ripple effects across every corner of the economy. The Congresswoman has also been on the road telling residents in her district about a bill she's drafted called the Child Care for Every Family Act that would dedicate federal funding to help families afford child care and help providers pay their staff. In this piece of legislation, no one would pay more than 7% of their income on child care. I anticipate that there will be a combination of private and government funding. And again, there will be that 7%, and depending on a person's income, that could be some, you know, that could be quite a contribution. But it, I think this is something that I do envision um, will be widely supported by the government because this is how we bolster our workforce. And with the economy and inflation being what they are, Megan Tabermina says inaction from Congress will land us right back where we just came from. Back in 2020, we saw what happened, right? We saw what happened when we took childcare away and, and the ripple effect on every industry in society, right? It um, had a great impact on our economy. It had a great impact on our K-12 system. Congress talks about the investment that they need to make. They need to understand that everything is linked to childcare because working parents need it to go to work. The Congresswoman says she'll be working tirelessly to secure this funding when she returns to Washington next week. In Dover, I'm Joanna Gagas, NJ Spotlight News. Well, a labor crisis is already happening among health care workers. More than 1,700 nurses at Robert Wood Johnson University Hospital in New Brunswick are still on the picket line five weeks after initiating a strike. And the battle between the union and the hospital is only getting uglier. Nurses who walked off the job lost their health insurance coverage at the start of the month. They're seeking better pay and staffing, two items they've been trying to lock in since the pandemic took its toll on the workforce and say they're prepared to strike for as long as it takes. Ted Goldberg has the latest. We get spit on, punched on, and we still come to work. Our benefit is sick time and they want to penalize us for sick time. How do you treat your family like that? Nurses at RWJ University Hospital are still on strike after a month and a day. It's been three weeks since nurses in the hospital have met at the negotiating table and nurses continue to insist on higher staffing levels that are enforceable. I had to go to the bathroom, not so bad, so I pushed the call bell. Two hours later, finally somebody came to help me to the bathroom. Um, and the nurse who cared for me greeted me with an apology. I'm sorry, I have so many other patients. RWJ Barnabas Health, an underwriter for NJ Spotlight, took away health insurance from striking workers last week. It's forced them to pay for COBRA if they want insurance and it's angered nurses and union leadership. They may think they're gonna squeeze us because they cut our health care. They may think they're gonna squeeze us because they brought the scabs in for another 30 days. But they're gonna learn a lesson here in New Brunswick that they'll never forget that we're gonna beat them, we're gonna last them one day longer, and they'll never ever try to on us again. It's getting really ugly. The hospital is absolutely resisting their demonstrating that they're willing to spend millions of dollars on replacement workers rather than agreeing to clear staffing standards that, that would benefit patients as well as nurses. Rebecca Given is an associate professor for the Rutgers School of Management and Labor Relations. She says stripping health care from striking workers isn't an extraordinary move, but she still thinks it's petty. If they said we understand as a healthcare organization that health insurance is, is significant to our nurses and as a show of good faith will allow them to have continuity. So it's, it's really taking uh, the lowest road they could take. The union got a boost this week as some of RWJ's newest nursing hires joined them. They were previously going through paid training, but now they're on the picket lines. The strategy is to send us out here so when the union goes to a second vote, we will vote against the strike. We're not going to do that. It was hard seeing our co-workers out here fighting, and there was nothing that we could really do until we made it out of our probation period. A long dormant bill in Trenton would require the staffing levels that nurses are striking for. State Senator Linda Greenstein is a sponsor for the bill, 
which could help shorten the strike if it's signed into law. Making sure that our hospitals and healthcare facilities are adequately and properly staffed means the staff will be well equipped to provide exceptional patient care and ultimately to save lives. We have also bills, we have, I have student loans, I can't speak for everybody else, but you know, I paid up until September, but what happens if this goes on longer? I just worry, you know, about financial situations along with 1,700 other nurses. Union President Judy Dinella says RWJ told them a strike would mean nurses are out of work for 60 days. We're still nearly a month away from that benchmark with little hope for a deal in sight. In New Brunswick, I'm Ted Goldberg, NJ Spotlight News. In our Spotlight on Business report, the pause on federal student loans that began in March 2020 will officially end next month, but interest on those loans resumed September 1st. And that means a lot of borrowers are likely to experience payment shock as they budget for the extra monthly expense. Life is a lot more expensive than it was three years ago when bills and interest rates were largely frozen as a pandemic relief measure. To help ease the transition, the buy the Biden administration is allowing for some flexibility during the first year repayments begin. So for everything you need to know, I'm joined by Paul Oster. He's the founder and CEO of the Eatontown-based credit management and repair firm Better Qualified. Paul, great to talk with you. Uh, so the Biden administration has sort of created what they're calling a year-long on-ramp for these borrowers. What does that mean? So they're just trying to ease the blow going into, you know, we've we've had a layoff for about three years here now. So they're just trying to make sure that as many of these borrowers can actually start to repay their loans. And a lot of these repayment programs have been in place um, since the Reagan administration. Um, but Biden, the, the Biden administration has updated them to include more people to make it even more affordable for these people to actually start paying back their student loans. So what will that look like if for the last three years uh, I have not had a payment? What should I expect? And will there be options for, say, payment plans? Because now I'm going to have to budget this in when I didn't have to think about it yeah. for a, a few years now. So listen, borrowers need to know, fortunately, one thing and one thing only. Go to studentaid.gov. If you want to take it a step further, you can go to studentaid.gov backslash IDR. These are the income-driven repayment plans that are now available to most of the student loan borrowers. Do not take phone calls from anybody. Don't reply to any text messages. Don't click on any links on social media or emails. The bad actors are already starting to pour in here. So studentaid.gov will have all of the information that you will need to know whether or not you're going to be eligible for these repayment plans. And let's not forget the, the creditors, the, the, the people who loaned you the money or the servicing company. Unfortunately, a lot of the borrower servicing companies have now changed. So when was the last time you logged into your account? When was the last time you spoke to your servicer? Be very, very proactive here. Every single day we get closer to October 1, these companies are getting flooded and inundated with inquiries. So be proactive, do it as soon as possible. If you haven't reached out to your loan servicer, do so now. Obviously, there are folks who are counting on, hoping for uh, President Biden's plan to wipe clear a significant amount of the student loans uh, to get through Congress. Uh, where do we stand on that? And, and how much should folks be hanging on that proposal? Yeah, listen, unfortunately, it became a very politicized football. It was being kicked back and forth. It caused a lot of confusion amongst borrowers. So I say you have to hope for the best, but prepare for the worst. I don't think that grandiose loan forgiveness plan is ever going to get passed. I think this is a compromise in what he's done in modifying the income-driven repayment plans. And look, if you've been paying back your student loans for 10 years or more, you really need to take a look at it because you might be eligible for complete loan forgiveness. If you work for a, a 501c3, if you work for any government agencies at all, whether it's teaching, you might be eligible for the That's forgiveness, but they're sure. not going to reach out to you and let you know that. You really have to take you know, the matters into your own hands. Sure. 
and find out what your eligibility really is. You are your own best advocate. All right, Paul Oster yeah. is the founder and CEO of Better Qualified in Eatontown. Paul, thanks so much. Thanks for having me on. On Wall Street, markets started slow on the first trading day of the holiday week. Here's how stocks closed today. Support for the Business Report provided by Newark Alliance, presenting the Future is Newark and Halsey Fest Street Festival, September 14th in downtown Newark. Event details online at halseyfestival.com. That's going to do it for us tonight, but don't forget to download the NJ Spotlight News podcast so you can listen anytime. I'm Brianna Venozzi. For the entire NJ Spotlight News team, thanks for being with us. Have a great evening. We'll see you back here tomorrow. NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of residents and businesses for more than 100 years. Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association, and by the PSEG Foundation. Have some water. Sir. Look at these kids. How are you? What do you see? I see myself. I became an ESL teacher to give my students what I wanted when I came to this country. The opportunity to learn, to dream, to achieve, a chance to belong and to be an American. My name is Julia Toriani Crompton and I'm proud to be an NJEA member. NJM Insurance Group has been serving New Jersey businesses for over a century. As part of the Garden State, we help companies keep their vehicles on the road, employees on the job, and projects on track working to protect employees from illness and injury, to keep goods and services moving across the state. We're proud to be part of New Jersey. NJM, we've got New Jersey covered.